All right, welcome back. Um, as we all know, of course, the elections are very uh, much in the air. Campaigns will soon kick off uh, in a couple of weeks, and then it will be full-blown political season up until February or even May of 2019. Um, we're talking a lot about you know voting and trying to get young people out there to cast their votes and make sure they have their voice heard. And I have you with me today, two first-time voters continuing our series, My First Vote. Um, Aisha Salahuddin, Beolu Wadako Thomas are both here with me. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Yes. Um, you're a first-time voter. Why have you decided to vote this time? Why is this so important for you? Um, well, mine is more of age, but okay. um, the reason why I want to vote this time is because I think it's important for all of us and not just me to sort of exercise our democratic rights. We're supposed to vote. We're supposed to participate in choosing um, our representatives in government. So I think there's just some form of power that comes with knowing that you actually had a say in, you know, choosing who is your president or your governor. Yeah. So that's you said you, well, off air, you had told me that uh, when I asked why you were voting, you said because you don't have a choice. Do you find that a lot, a lot of young people believe that as well? Well, it's hard to tell because then it depends on the said individual. But I personally think that um, for a very long time, we've, we've had... Um, administrations that you just know can do better than what they've done. And so for you to not vote, it's, it's, it's sort of like a signal to say that you're okay with that. So that's why my answer was I don't have a choice because I believe that we can do so much better than what, we, what we've what we had you know, over the past years. And that's why I said I don't have a choice than to yeah. participate here. Yeah. You have been eligible before, but you're voting for the first time. What changed for you this time? Well, basically, um, I want to have an input in the affairs of the country. And um, the only way I can have an input is by voting in elected leaders, casting my vote. I exercise this civic duty, and once I exercise this civic duty, I am sure that, okay, I have a moral compass to judge, criticize, and highlight that, okay, this is government is wrong. But if I'm sitting at home and the government is, of the day is not performing, I have no moral right to talk because I have not been in the process. I'm not part of the process. And as Desmond Tutu said, he said, in situations of injustice, if you're new, you can't be neutral. Because once you're neutral, automatically you're on the side of the oppressor. So if the government of the day is bad and I'm neutral, that means I'm supporting the government and I'm happy with it. And so going forward, if I want to be part of the process, the running affairs in my country, I have to cast my vote. Yeah, same question I asked her now. Do you find that young people around you are thinking this way too? Because there's a belief that a lot of people wanted to register this time. A lot of people tried to, but there's also a good number who just believe there's no point. So what did you get a sense of around you? Well, optically, I can say that people actually want to vote. The political awareness in our country is high. There's a high spike in it. People want to participate. People want to vote. However, most people are downcast about it. Most people feel that their votes won't count. But like I usually say, politics is a game of numbers. Your votes count. If I vote, you vote, he votes, and everyone, everyone votes. We come together in our numbers and we vote. We can possibly change the outcome of an election. And that's why I look at the Ocean State election, the narrative. The margin between the party that won the election and the party that lost, the, the runner-up, was 482 points. And before the election, INEC said the people that have not collected their PVCs prior to the election were for over 400,000. So you can see there's a disparity between people that registered and people that ended up voting. So we need to find a way that people who give political opinions or are interested in the process also come out to vote so that we can ensure that we have political pundits transfer or transform to real election deciders at the poll. Let's talk about candidates now, and this is not just talking about the presidency, because a lot of times we, we tend to focus too much on the center, uh, but it's also a case of most people not even necessarily knowing the candidates outside of the presidency. People just want to vote for president and mm -hmm. go home, you know. How do you identify who you decide to vote for? What sort of qualities are you looking at? And does it differ from, like, say, what you want from a president, from what you want from a local government chairman? What sort of qualities do you look at before you vote? The first thing I would say is that while there's a lot of um, political awareness, there still needs to be more because people tend to just focus on the president. And I always say that those at the, the lower levels of government are actually more important than but just the president the, is so just, far removed Exactly. From, yeah. So your local government chairman is actually closer to you than the president. You most likely get contact with him easier than the president. And so you have to pay attention to that. 
you ask some people like what what local government do you belong in they don't know or what ward so those are the little things that they have to start with so in terms of you know um figuring out who they want who they want to every every local government has an office even if you feel like you don't you're not going to get enough information online Go to find out where your nearest local government is. Go in there, have a walk someday. Just just find out how things are even going going on there at first, and then find out who the candidates are, who is contesting, who wants to be chairman, who wants to be a councillor. These little things. Do a Google search on them. Listen to. They always have word rounds. Do a Google search on them. Listen to what they're saying. Read up on their policies if they have any. Just these little things at the local level help you to be able to make your decision. So it's then when you have all of that information gathered, it's left to you to decide what exactly you're looking for in a candidate and sort of go for them based on what you want. But the emphasis here is for us to pay attention to the local level. It is very, more important than even the president or some governors. Yeah. That's, that's How much of that thing. rests with the politicians? Because I know apathy for a lot of people. People say, oh, I don't even know who's contesting mm -hmm. most times, you know. Um, besides sometimes the governor and the president. Sometimes even the House of Rose members, people say, oh, I don't, I don't even know who the contestants are. Is it a politician issue? Are they not campaigning properly enough? Or are we not asking questions enough? Well, I think they are campaigning properly because obviously they cannot win the election if they don't campaign properly. And the fault lies in the electorate. They know these things, but they, they are not concerned about it. Like most pressure, the pressure is always on the presidency. However, they forget that the state governments also receive allocations, they also receive subventions, and they receive a lot of money to do a lot of constituency projects that can affect the country positively. If you look at healthcare, local governments provide healthcare, local government can fix some roads, but we tend to always look at the presidency for everything. We always look at the federal government, the federal government, and we let these guys off the hook. We need to keep more attention on these guys because that's why the area of restructuring, people talk about that and everything. We have to keep these people accountable. So the politicians are there, they do their campaign. We just have to be able to put pressure on them through our vote and put our leaders and make them be accountable for these things. So when, an elect, when an, an someone that wants to vote comes out and he sees all the positions, all the attainable offices, he should be determined to say, okay, let me hear your manifesto. Let me see what you're talking about. Are you talking about reforms or are you just coming to undermine the opposition? Nigerian political parties are built to always undermine or um, throw shades at political parties. They never come out on their own issue-based campaigns. And that's what we need right now. We need issue-based campaigns. And even when we have that, we'll be able to make better decisions on our candidates. Yeah. I know you're sort of jumping the gun, but um, a lot of people are very apathetic because there's a belief that politicians are only nice during elections, you know, so they come out, sometimes they share things, I've seen bags of rice, handbags, you know, all of that, recharge cards, and you, whatever questions you ask, they are very willing to answer. Mm -hmm. Every interview, they're available, you know, mm -hmm. town hall meetings, they're there, but mm -hmm. as soon as they get in, it's sort of, okay, we're back in our hole or in our bubble until... The mm -hmm. next cycle comes again. So we're talking about these questions that we need to ask, mm -hmm. how do we keep the questions going when sometimes it feels like these politicians are not accessible? Um, you mean not accessible during the elections or after, after the, the elections? elections. Yeah, so when that, they get into office. We have, that's why we have to pay extra attention to those questions while they are while they are campaigning. And the reason, the more the fact that they are more accessible during the elections is enough for us to ask the important questions. If you, I've I've been reading, you know, the policy documents of some some candidates, and they're saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, but they're not answering the how. We know that you're going to do this, you're going to give us words, but tell us how. And those are the kind of questions that we should focus on. When you have an idea of the how, do they plan to increase the budget, do they plan to increase taxation, all those little things. When you have an idea of the how, it's to give you a sense of direction to what they are you know, what they stand for or their beliefs and all these kind of things. Those are the kind of questions we need to ask them now that we have the chance. It's then, it is what is going to, you know, give you, be, give you the build-up to knowing that, all right, I think this guy is going to perform. The, I will do this is easy. It is the, how will you do it? How will yeah. you implement it? What will you do that we need to start asking now? Because I am 100% certain that when they get in, you will not even see, you will not see them again. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. And to add to what she's saying, I'm very critical when it comes to manifestos of politicians. Mm -hmm. I try and listen deeper. If a politician comes out to say, I'm going to create 4 million jobs, mm -hmm. I'm always critical about it because currently you can see some states cannot even pay salaries mm -hmm. with the current size and which structure we have and current um, labor structure. So how are you going to create more jobs? But if you talk as a politician about creating an enabling business environment for SMEs, because SMEs are the biggest drivers 
of the economy. If you have more SMEs, people are going to be engaged and employed. Then I'll listen to you and I'll know that, okay, this guy is sincere. This guy knows what he's doing. It's the same thing when you talk about electricity. Um, when, we, when I come, I'm going to make 40,000 megawatts and do all that. How are you going to do it? You have to be critical. You have to know that, okay, this person has actually done a lot of research. And when he has done a lot of research, I'm sure that, okay, this person has a team. He knows what he's working on. Because basically, it's always the slogans. They always come with the same things. They say the same things. These things sound cliche. They sound familiar in our environment. We need to be sure that this guy is saying what this guy is saying. I'm very sure about it. What this guy is saying, he has worked on it. And from there, it's easier to implement. Yeah. One thing I want to ask now, we're talking about the details now and the how. I'm speaking of details, what sorts of questions should young people be asking? Because as much as we may be asking questions, what matters to you may not matter to, um, I don't know, the manufacturer in Newi, mm -hmm. because your issues are different, or the pensioner in Ibadan. What, and most young people have sort of similar issues. So as a young person, what sort of questions or what should we be looking out for in a candidate? So um, I'll say because we're young people, and I think we should ask them, we should be focused on a candidate that has more solid long-term plans, because this is our future on the line. So when I say long-term plans, in terms of it's in terms of building strong institutions, those, that's how that's where our question should be tilted to. So it's 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 kind of like um, if you say basic things like how will you build the roads, and they give you some some flimsy excuse, and then there's nothing to show that there's going to be strong infrastructure in the future. Then how is how are we going to you know? Um, how are we going to know that this continuity will be present? So let's we'll pay let's, for them. Do you, do you get so let's 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 be specific in terms of continuity, in terms of long term plans, in terms of okay, you're going to build infrastructure, but what exactly are you going to put in place so that after you go, um, after you go, that this is going to be here? We have we've had presidents like um, what's the president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez or something. Everybody thought he was fantastic until he left until he left office because his whatever he built there could not outlive him. There was nothing for the young people then to go, you know, to go further. We'll never be able to access someone like Kagami now until he actually leaves office because everything we're saying some great some great things now, but will those things outlive him? Those are the kind of little things that we should focus on. Healthcare. Healthcare can be great in your tenure. But have you built an institution that will ensure that this keeps running? Have you like those are the little, little things that we should so let's be more focused on things that will actually be permanent, things that will last not after four years or eight years, then someone else will come and, you know, disrupt the institution yeah. and start again. So are jobs the biggest issue for young people, you think? Yes, jobs are actually the biggest issue and it gets more competitive as the year goes by. If you look at the statistics, in 2030, 2050, we're going to be the third largest population in the world. So is the government ready for that? <laughs> That's what we have to ask ourselves. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> ourselves that question. So when we ask ourselves that question, Jobs are very important. It's how they make these jobs, how they create these jobs. They're not going to open a, an agency and say they are recruiting. No. How are they going to make an enabling business environment? That is the key thing. So we youth are always interested in that, things that will make our life better. So we know that, OK, in the long run, we know that things are going to get better and better. And however, without looking at um, what is going on currently, we look at depth profile, we look at the reserves, we look at, OK, are these people saving for our future? Are they diversifying this oil sector? Are they diversifying the economy? So that we know that if oil is at $20, $10, $30, looking at the whole supply and demand, we know that we are still going to have a future. We are not dependent on oil. So we look at these things that are very, very critical. And when we find the, um, the answer to that, we are good to go. All right. We're going to take a break now. When we come back, we'll find out... Um how realistic a lot of the expectations of our first-time voters are considering the pool of candidates we have now. Please stay with us. Welcome back. We're concluding our conversation with our first-time voters. And um, before the break, I said I was going to ask, you know, looking realistically now, the people we have, because all the forms have been submitted to INEC. We know mm -hmm. our candidates. And I want to maybe keep it to our presidency now, because mm -hmm. we don't know what local governments or <laughs> states you're going to be voting in. Looking at the pool of candidates we have with our presidential candidates, um, I know a lot of the manifestos are out now, but we'll have, we kind of have a feel of some of them or mm -hmm. what they're talking about. Are you hopeful? Hopeful in terms of? Sort of your expectations okay. from, from a candidate. So, you know, interestingly, I'm particularly excited about this election because we've seen a change from previous years. Now more of the candidates are, you know, speaking out in terms of there are people having world press conferences. Um, one of the candidates is having hers tomorrow. More people are talking about what they're doing. Um, we've seen 
the one of them released their policy documents, another one is preparing on it. So it seems like there's an, a more conscious effort to communicate with the voters this time. And so that is the part that is making me a bit hopeful yeah. because before now we could you could barely see you know them communicating saying what what they want to do granting as much in, i don't think um I mean, since I started observing, I don't think we've had more interviews than this particular election. We've it's all, not even really started. Do you get what I mean? And then we, we're having more third, um, fourth candidates now. So it seems like, you know, the conversation is shifting. People are more politically aware. People have started asking the right questions. Candidates are doing more of the talking. So am I hopeful? Yes. In that regard, I am hopeful because I know that the next election, even after 2019, would be, you know, um, would be even be better in terms Keep of communications. Building, yeah. Yes. So I am happy. Agree? Well, I agree with what she said, and I'm sure as years goes by, our democracy is getting stronger. Uh, we have an emerging democracy. We have to protect. We have to protect this democracy, and we've seen in antecedents. We've looked at antecedents or previous um, elections. Incumbent governors, incumbent presidents are being ousted the first mm -hmm. term. Those were impossible before. Those are impossible in other countries. Citizens who are subject to dictatorship, citizens of other countries, like um, certain countries in Africa. They are subject to things like um, you have establishments that don't want to leave the offices. So, but here is a different thing. It's a different ball game. People are actually scared. They are actually scared. These politicians are scared of our votes. They know that ah, if they slip up, if they are being complacent, they will be out anytime soon. So they actually, it actually is improving um, their competence. They will be like, they know that it's not, it's not, it's not the order of the day. They know it's not like before. So. Looking at all these candidates, ideally, the way people vote, the way most people are guilty of voting is they look at the two big candidates and they see which one is the lesser evil, which one is um, the greatest good, because they don't believe the other guys have a realistic chance of winning. And the funny thing is, there are so many millions of people in that category. They, believe, they don't believe this guy will win. Option C will win, option D will win. They'll be like, okay, so let's not waste our votes on that line. Let's keep our votes between A and B. But when, like I said, politics is a game of numbers. When A in Abuja, A in Lagos, C in Kwara, when we keep doing these things, we all take away our votes from someone that we could have been better. Someone oh, you really better. believed in. Someone you really believed in because we're all thinking alike. We need, to be, we need to stand firm and believe that these guys can win. And we're looking at the France example. He, Macron was away from the establishment. So we need to believe that it can happen in Nigeria. Yes, it might not happen in 2019 because these other politicians don't have a structure and our voting population is not, um, we're not well informed and educated as the French. Let's be honest with that. Because the irony of it is the percentage of people that decide our future in this country is probably one eighth. If you look at 25th, the, the 2015 election, and this one eighth of the people are not educated, they are, they are not literate as the French. Yeah. So we need to be sure that some more, voter some more voters can come and, okay, we get better. And we believe that another party or another politician can win. But we just have to believe. It's just about belief. Thank you very much, Akbeodua. Thank you very much, Aisha. Um, good luck with your, <laughs> with your votes. Thank you. Thank and you. like they said, if you're a young person out there, Stand firm, hold on to your vote, and please make sure you do go out and vote because it is a very crucial time in our nation's history, and you, only you, can decide that. Like I always say, you can follow the conversation on Twitter, Wayneja TV is the handle. The hashtag to follow is dropping minds. You can also visit our website, wayneja.tv. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next Sunday.